I'm Judy Murray. Behind every champion is a driving force. Wanting to prove people wrong was something that was a very powerful driving force in me. We all got prepared for how to perform, but no one prepared us for what will happen after. Dina Asher-Smith, the best of British. If you can see it, you can believe it, and you can believe that that could be you. We knew that we were a part of something bigger. More glory for Sarah's story. If you don't stop doing this, you may go deaf. It was everybody else that almost had to suffer because of, because of what I did. Stunning stuff from Anderson. Becky, I think you need a sports psychologist. And I was like, why? What's wrong with me? I was a little bit scared when he first talked to us. I knew that there was a massive responsibility. The undisputed lightweight champion of the world. Yeah! It's going to be an historic second goal. I didn't know about a breakdown, becoming a self-harmer, being depressed. I had no idea what that meant. If you tell me I can't do something, I will go out of my way to prove you wrong. It's Dina Asher-Smith, and just look at that time. It's a new British record. She's come along at a very important moment, not just in British athletics, but she's come along at a very important moment socially uh, and politically for all of us. Dina didn't get there just by her talent, skill, and hard work. She had extra things that she had to get over, that she had to persevere through because of the color of her skin. What an absolutely terrific run from Asha Smith. She's becoming the female star of these championships. I was literally in tears um, because she did it the way that we had discussed it. She did everything right including the winning bit. Her sport is now kind of an art, you know, she's turned it into an art form. And that's really difficult to do, and I think by doing that, she has established a huge following. Asha Smith is on fire. That was her dream. That was her dream when she was younger, as she was going through the school, she always wanted to be an Olympian. Running down Dina Asher Smith, but she goes away again, and it's going to be Dina Asher Smith takes the win here. She's not only a fantastic role model for young people, she's, she's a fantastic role model for people. The doors wouldn't be opened had she not been the way she is. It's an absolutely terrific run from Asher Smith. She's positive, she's strong, she's successful, and by the way, she's beautiful. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? <laughs> it's just a no-brainer. Dina Asher-Smith, the best of British, is finally on top of the world. Dina Asher-Smith, the fastest woman in British history. I want to hear the whole story from being bribed with an ice cream by your best friend to join the running club at primary school, all the way through to becoming the world champion at 200 metres in 2019. So can we go back to your childhood and tell me a bit about what was that like growing up? I was just a very energetic child, I have to say. My mum and dad were constantly trying to find ways for me to expend my energy. I was always running around, always causing trouble or <laughs> mischief. And uh, they always had me in loads of different clubs and loads of different sporting activities when I was younger. So. When I first found running, which was when they set up a running club at primary school, I would have been about eight years old. And at first, my friend asked me, oh, do you want to come with me? Because she really wants to go. And I just thought, no, you know, like, running doesn't really appeal to me. <laughs> Ironically, yeah. I was thinking, no, just running around, getting out of breath, but there's no, like, points, no nothing, like, not, doesn't really appeal to me. And then she was like, if you come with me, I'll get you an ice cream from the ice cream van after school. So I was like, obviously, I was like, OK, yeah, sure. So I just thought I was going to go with her, like, on her first time, because she was a bit nervous. I was sporty at that point, so the teachers obviously encouraged us all to go to this new club. So I wrote down my name and had a little jog. I was asked long didn't really think anything of it but um, by kind of signing up on that first day I also signed myself up to represent the school at their local cross-country competition <laughs> which I was highly unamused about <laughs> and that was at Crystal Palace it was the Bromley Primary Schools cross-country I knew I was sporty but I didn't really know that I could run 
well or like better than some other people so at that, that point. That was your first competition? That was my first ever competition. My mum was like, honestly, like you're representing the school, just go along, have fun. If you do it, you don't like it, we'll never do it again. And um, I remember I had a Nintendo GameCube and I really wanted this Bratz Dolls game. <laughs> You're and so she's, easily bright, I'm don't you? I'm so easily <laughs> bright. I really wanted this Brat Stolls game. And um, she was like, if you do well, if you do it, like I'll get you the game. I remember finishing and they handed me like a little piece of paper. And I remember I was just so exhausted. I had a little orange hat on and my mum was like at the finish. She was writing, oh my God, you did so well. And I was, I had no idea. I was just so tired. Like, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> and I looked at the card and it said like fifth out of like three, 400 kids. And I remember being like, oh, <laughs> I did really good. And then I got a little trophy and I got the Bratz game. And I was like, you know what? I might do this one again. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how if your first experience is a positive one yeah. and you have a bit of success. Yeah. You want to do it again, whereas if it's not a good experience, oh. and many kids don't have positive experiences yeah. of sport, so the environment is so incredibly important. But when you ran in that first race, was there somebody watching you that spotted that you had a talent? Yes, definitely. I remember um, at that first race, there were scouts there, representatives from the Bees Academy. By then, I was going to run a club a bit more regularly, and I thought, oh, I've been asked to go to this club twice now. I'm going to go and it's at this track and I've literally been coming here every week ever since so <laughs> yeah I love it and I, I love that we're here and I can see where it where it all started and mm. where it and where it continues but when you when you went for those first few times and you said you tried lots of different things looking back do you think that the coaches were letting you try lots of different things all of you mm. to see which things you might particularly be best suited to Honestly, it's just about having fun. And like, it's not necessarily one of those things where they go and cherry pick kids out. Some people like, they're there and they get more confident and they make more friends and they just enjoy it, get more fit, have fun. For me, like I was doing it and it was actually run at that time by my current coach, John Blackie. When she came along, it was very evident immediately that she had some talent, albeit at that stage very much untapped talent. Uh, so we knew that she would be a very good athlete. What we didn't know at that stage is how she would turn out, what her events would be. Uh, she was pretty good at pretty much everything she did. I didn't really know John when I joined. He was just kind of like the boss. So <laughs> I didn't really say much, but he met my parents. He was just quietly making sure that I didn't try anything that was gonna hurt me or too crazy. So I was never allowed to hurt or anything like that. <laughs> now I understand that he made sure that I was having a great time and enjoyed it because he was keen. He wanted me to stay in the sport. As with all youngsters, you, you don't want to push them into things that they um, might not stay in. So you do everything. So she literally did all events all the time. He was just like, she'll be interesting to keep watching. And, and then through the years, suddenly it was like, oh, now I'm with John for three days a week as opposed to like never. And I just didn't notice how it built up. But, um, and then I was like international and I was like, oh, <laughs> look where we are. And yeah, yeah, it's been a very cool journey so far. <laughs> Certainly at eight years old, uh, the last thing you think of is uh, world champion, Olympic champion. It just doesn't feature. Uh, you do not want to put pressure on youngsters by saying, oh, you could do this, you could do that. Um, that that's totally unfair. I love the whole thing about the fun, the friends, the fitness, because those are the three things that get people into physical activity. They're also the same three things that retain people in it. So you learn without realising, mm. and it's the fun that keeps you wanting to go back. It's always got to have, be fun. You've always got to switch it up. You've always got to be learning, getting the skills and the work you need, but learning it in fun ways and fun and energising and invigorating ways. Otherwise, it does. It gets monotonous, and you've got to make sure that you're constantly enjoying it because that's how you're going to want to achieve and want to get the best out of yourself. So, yeah, lots of banter, lots of fun, but also um, serious when we need to be at the same time. John was a volunteer coach here mm. um, at the Athletics Club, and athletics really relies on a huge Network volunteer workforce, doesn't it, to make everything, everything happen. Do you think it helped him to help you and the other girls at the athletics club that he had two daughters? 
he was he's a, he's been a dad first you know so he knows he knows teenage girls he understands puberty he's seen it he's been there <laughs> like <laughs> he knows about mood swings he knows about moods he understands periods menstrual cycles obviously there are certain times when uh, you have to be aware of what is going on with uh, the girls uh, as they get older um, out of uh, the very, very junior stage. Um, but you, to be honest, you just take it in your stride. Many male coaches just turn away from it because yeah, they yeah. don't want to discuss it. And I think it. there's still that attitude sometimes in high performance sport as well. Like, because if you've got lots of male doctors or male kind of like medical support staff, they kind of just turn away from it and try and not talk about it because they don't understand it. And it might not be that they're even embarrassed about it, but they just don't really don't understand how important it is or how much it does affect your mood, how your body feels, if you're in pain, if you can use your hips, like it is so important to whether we're gonna run fast, whether we're gonna be in the mood to kind of burst into tears or not, you know, like it, it's all part of it. It has been challenging because for male practitioners, obviously they haven't felt it and they don't know what it's like. It, it, it blows my mind that Coaches just can't have that conversation with their athletes and the coaches come to me saying what's wrong with what's wrong with them today? Why can't they perform today? And often it's just because of what's going on in their body But the athletes feel they can't discuss it and I think that that's actually really hard for a coach He's beating themselves up about why their athletes aren't training well or performing well or competing well Yet actually this could be the hidden answer that just needs to be discussed and and managed Lots of people kind of shy away from it, but John has has never, ever, ever. Like, if I say, oh, I'm, I'm having cramps, or even, like, I can have so many open discussions with John, and he's like, if you're in that much pain, let's just, yeah, we'll adjust it, we'll adjust this week, we'll adjust this, we'll adjust that. I shouldn't say it's a breath of fresh air because it's kind of sad that it is, but um, especially for a male coach, yeah, it's something that some do, but not all, and, um, but obviously it's such a huge, a factor in, in female high performance sport and high performance things so were there female coaches around at the club yeah definitely so when i was at the bees um loads of the coaches were men and women when it comes to high performance coaches there it would be great if we could get some more funding and investment to see more diversity across the higher performance elite coaches there is absolutely no reason at all whilst there should not be the same uh, level of uh, men and women in, in coaching. I regard them as probably better than me, um, but I was just lucky. I get asked so much about what's it like to be a woman in sport? Is it unfair? And I'm like, obviously we have areas to address, but when you're talking about track and field, for me, it's just so natural to be fully respected for what you do as a woman and not compared to the men in terms of performance and times, because we are fundamentally different, but respected for what we are and what we do. We're doing the same thing, might get different distances and different times, but they're still at the cutting edge of human performance, you know? You're still the best of what is to offer. I think it's really important that we have athletes who are willing to speak about those things and speak about things that might be slightly uncomfortable to hear. Um, but we, it needs to be said, because if we don't say it, then who else would take it seriously? You need a mixture of people around the table, otherwise change does not come. It's very difficult for one sole voice to speak up. And you see that with, with ethnicity too. Um, we did a, an investigation on The Telegraph recently, I think uh, across over 400 places on sports boards, um, governing bodies in this country, there were four black women. Um, when you think of, you know, the iconic black sportswomen and how much they've done for sport, and yet you can't, you can't find a place for black women on your sports governing bodies to make decisions. Um, it's, it's a disgrace. You felt very lucky to be involved in a sport that has equal opportunity, I guess, yeah. for the men and the women. Um, was it always the same in your environment here at the Athletics Club? Just as many boys and, as oh, girls yeah. and everybody treated the same? 100%, like, from what I remember, I 
being a girl or a boy didn't matter. We'd all run together, especially at an age where there's no physiological differences because you're all before puberty. Everybody's running together, everybody's competing against each other. Everybody was just children. <laughs> but it tends to be when you step into the wider sporting landscape, then suddenly they're like, female athlete. And you're like, what is a female athlete? I'm an athlete. And then suddenly it's when, uh, yeah, you step out into the wider world of sport where people want to put all these little markers and mark it. And then you're like, what on earth is happening? Being a kit runner at the 2012 Olympics, Olympics in London as a teenage athlete, what was that like? That was absolutely phenomenal. They let people, the athletes from the local clubs or grassroots clubs from around the country come and kind of interact with the events and kit carry. If you're in Taekwondo, you'd help there, or swimming, you'd help there, you know. And um, for track and field, yeah, back Ethan Bromley, so my club, they got to send 10 people to kit carry. And I won the raffle, one of the little things. So I was one of the 10, I was so happy. And I remember we were kit carrying on Super Saturday and we had obviously had no idea that it was going to be one of the most fantastic fantastic nights for British sports like ever um, when we got given that rota and I remember we were literally like just off the finish line when we saw Jess do her like iconic arms out pose and it was the most incredible environment anybody that was there you just I can't describe it in words and I know that sounds so stereotypical but um, there is no words to describe the stadium. I don't think anybody knew the enormity of 2012 and how it was gonna take off and the way that people were gonna embrace it and the way people from all over the world came. What stood out for me was the fact that you could turn around and there were people in the crowd crying, they were screaming, they were shouting and the joy was just euphoric. It was just off the charts. And I remember thinking, wow, by kind of focusing, applying themselves and just really focusing on their talent and achieving their potential really, these athletes have managed to make people feel like that because the whole state, even the whole country, they remember that day. I think that's what we have to remember as athletes. You know, we don't just do our bit and leave. We hopefully stay there to do our bit and make an impact. And you hope that the other athletes can pick that up and, you know, do their own bit and leave an impact. And that's how the, the chain of, I suppose, influence goes down. That is the power of sport, like it, that, that moment. And, I knew that I wanted to be an elite athlete. I was already on my way to doing that at that age. I was already an international, but um, that just really motivated me to try and just achieve my personal best and achieve, oh, fulfill my potential because you are just able to inspire and empower so many people through what well, an ability that sometimes you might even take for granted, you know? I know that Dean has now taken on that that um, role with, with a great, you know, we've completely <laughs> um, great spirit. And uh, I know that there's so many young athletes who will look at her as a hero and they will be inspired by her. In lane number four, Dina Asher-Smith of Great Britain, 19 years old, the youngest in the field by some four years. Can she challenge Kathy Cook's British record? You became the fastest teenager in the world. I mean, like, how cool is that? Yeah. Any pressure that you felt from um, that tag? To be fair, no, and I think I credit that to the fact that I've got a very stable family life. I'm stable with John, I'm stable here. So it, it kind of doesn't matter what I do on track. And even when I achieve things, even like going up to world championships and becoming world champion, becoming European champion and stuff like that, it's cool, don't get me wrong, like it's really amazing, but I still want to go on to do better things. I always want to get quicker, I want to get faster. So that mentality from when I was eight years old has never changed. Like, it's just the fact that I'm in it to see what the edge of my personal human performance is. She, she wasn't someone who went around being I'm the European champion, I'm a world champion. She was quite actually sort of modest in that way. It was when she was at school, she was here to be 
at school and doing her studies and everything else. I mean, obviously, she'd always do the extracurricular athletics with me. Um, and it was always really inspiring for the other students. It's even more inspiring now. I never expected to become a GB international because I was just always coming down here, having fun, messing around with my friends, you know? And then suddenly, in a few years, you're representing GB. It's, it's crazy. I can imagine it's, it's very nerve-wracking because you don't have the experience, and experience counts for a lot in sport. Experience is what really settles your nerves. I continue to kind of surprise myself, and even though John seems to be less surprised at these things than I am, <laughs> um, I think John had a plan for you. He understands, because he's been in the sport for years, he knows what talent is, he knows what these things are better than I ever will, because I was just, I'm just me, you know, I don't know for reference how good I am talent-wise relative to everybody else. It was emphasised that I was good, that I kept winning, but I was never treated any differently to anybody else. So um, I just kept training and then the achievements just kind of got better and your bar just kind of goes up. But in terms of becoming, yeah, like fastest teenager and then other stuff, because I've just always been kind of like of an improvement mentality, it was kind of like, that's cool, great, tick, move on. I remember when I was in Beijing and I broke the British record, I didn't know that I was close to it. I didn't know that it was kind of within my grasp throughout the competition until like I literally did it. I was like, oh, it says NR next to my name. I was like, oh, cool, like, <laughs> <laughs> national record, that's nice. But um, with me, I'm just kind of, I'm one of those people, I'm not really too much of a statistician when it comes to track and field. I just kind of keep trying to improve. And if you rack up stuff on the way, then it's great, it's fun. You have the degree in history yes. from King's. Yes. You have three A-levels. But the one I'm most interested in <laughs> is the 10 A's at GCSE level and the thousand pounds that you oh, could earn through yeah. a bribe yet again <laughs> from your mum. I feel bad because it was 10 A stars, <laughs> so I feel bad correcting you. <laughs> I'm not like this anymore, but when I was younger, my mum just used to incentivise me. <laughs> and she said, oh yeah, for your GCSEs, um, 100 pound per A star. And I think she predicted, like she thought in my head I was going to get like three or four. And I was like, cool, yeah, calm. But, um, I worked really hard because I knew that I wanted something. <laughs> like I wanted a computer and that was kind of X price. So I worked really hard. And then I remember on results day, I got 10 A stars and my mum was like, oh, I'm really happy for you. But Dina, I wasn't expecting this. <laughs> I'm like, it's fine, no problem. We'll take our time. <laughs> I'm not going to put pressure on you for anything, obviously. She could pay obviously. it in installments yeah, to give her that like, option. No. I was like, no pressure, no stress. I was never aware she was being bribed by her mother. <laughs> I thought she was just, I think she is highly self-motivated. I don't think, I think that's a nice treat for her, but um, I think she's very highly motivated anyway. This may well be a West Indian thing and it may well be a African thing that our, you know, first generation parents always used to talk about, you know, education, that's something that can't be taken away from you. Um, and to make sure that you always educate yourself. You may be brilliant at one thing, but always make sure that you can flex and do something else. The thing that most endeared me to her, other than the fact that she's a very talented athlete and very focused and giving a lot back, her dissertation was uh, on the history of jazz, which is my other passion. So if Dina's watching this, could I have some of my books back, please? It seems like you did a really great job of juggling your athletics career with your education and your social life. It is uh, formed a fundamental part of who I am, but um, yeah, it was it was definite. It definitely took very good organisation skills. Like, but I think that was part of the process for me for doing yeah my degree and still trying to make the Olympic team, make World Championships team, and seeing my friends and stuff like that, because it made me very efficient at knocking out essays and reading and studying and, and realising that I don't have forever to procrastinate because I have a training session to do <laughs> or I want to go and see my friends. So I have to focus, get the task done, close it, move on. Dina is the whole package and she's th the whole package because she understands what she needs to do to be the best. And I, I always say to my athletes, look at Dina. I said to Dina, how are you doing? How's things going? you know, in Doha before she won all her medals. And she said, you know what, Christine, it's a big sacrifice and this is, a, this is my job. Right now, this is what I've got to do. This is where I need to be. 
because it's only for a moment in time. You, you get your degree, and at what point, after getting your degree, did you decide to make athletics a full-time career? I kind of always saw athletics as something that I would do alongside having like a job and a career in something else. But as I kind of got better and it became more and more feasible that, OK, you can make a living from this. Oh, OK, you're actually quite good at this. OK, maybe you should focus. <laughs> I function better, particularly on track, when I have other things to focus on because I won't overthink what I'm doing when I'm running. You just kind of get on the track, run, listen to what John says, don't overthink it, don't overprocess it, just do it and execute and, and that's all you really have to do. And yeah, when your brain sometimes is dealing with more than one thing at a time, that personally helps me. Won't always help everybody out, but for me it works wonders, so. You loved the challenge of competition yes. from a young age. <laughs> and that is a massive advantage, isn't it? Especially with girls. Did you then never have all these issues and angst that teenage girls have when your, your body's changing and your emotions are changing and you become much more aware of how you look? Did yeah. that ever have an effect no. on you? I never really judged my body for what it looked like. Like, because from such a young age, I have been trying to get better, get faster, get stronger, improve on how fast I run 100 meters, improve on how much I can squat in the gym, improve on how many pull-ups I can do, if any. <laughs> To me, my body's always been a tool. It's always been a way for me to express myself. It was only a few years ago when I started doing stuff in other sectors that I realized that that wasn't normal because I'd always grown up in a sporting environment. So it's always been more about you understanding what your body needs to do yeah, for you to achieve yeah, what you want to achieve. Yeah, it's a really weird way of explaining it. Sometimes I'll pull on jeans, and obviously I'm an athlete, sometimes the jeans wouldn't get over my thighs, but I would never be like, I'd never be upset by that. I was like, oh, stupid jeans and then <laughs> <laughs> yeah possibly yeah, somebody and then I'm like, get a different one because I've never seen my body like that I'm like it's always my body has given me so many amazing opportunities in life I've been able to go to so many places racing I've been able to meet so many fantastic people and achieve so many things like I've been able to accomplish some of my dreams through what my body can do so that's what it looks like I don't care Dina what, what Dina's been able to do has been able to cross boundaries with her with her sport and her sport is now kind of an art you know she's turned it into an art form and that's really difficult to do and I think by doing that she has established a huge following where people actually want to be with her and want to work with her and want to be around her. She's not only a fantastic role model for young people she's she's a fantastic role model for people and, and that's a difference, and she, she goes into very many different areas, like the modelling. I think she's, she's cut across so many um, things that she shouldn't have cut across, and people are embracing her, and, and she's got a doll, doll that looks like her, and I was thinking, that's amazing. I said, do you know, I said to my daughters, do you know how big this is? It makes me sad when sometimes I talk to younger girls or younger women when they talk about um, staying in sport and they get very nervous around sweating, they get nervous around showing muscles and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, but you're, that's your body and that's a beautiful thing. Like, you can achieve so many amazing goals, you can get so many amazing opportunities um, if you just kind of work hard and apply yourself to stuff. And I think it's really upsetting and sad that something that is so arbitrary, so silly <laughs> as aesthetics would want to stop people doing that. It's really about putting um, positive body image at the heart of what we do. We've, we've changed to having fully representative mannequins of different shapes and sizes. Just because you're bigger doesn't mean you're not fit or sporty. Just because you're smaller doesn't mean you're not fit or sporty. But it's also really important to show real women, you know, that have big muscles because they've worked hard for them. You know, there's no shame in that. Getting muscles is like a point of anxiety for some young women. And that's why when I'm shooting like photo shoots and stuff, I 
if I can and it works artistically, I always try and show my muscles or showcase my shoulders because I want people to look at a poster and be like, oh no, I look like that and it's fine because that girl's on a billboard. And that might seem like something really small and something that's inconsequential, but to a lot of girls that really matters. In a brand sense of anything Dina does, it's like, is this platform, what, do, what does this platform offer me? And like, what's it gonna offer to other people? And I do genuinely think that is pretty much how she makes any decision in the branding space. We've all um, become accustomed to this phrase, you know, you can't be what you can't see. We want people to see people like Dina. It's, it's really inspiring. And I think that it, there's a lot of young girls, and I'm sure particularly a lot of young black and ethnic minority girls are thinking, well, if she can do it, maybe I can do it. If she's going to work with someone, it has to be because she's proud of what that represents and it feels authentic to her. Because I hear so often that, oh, I really want to do, but I'm scared my arm's going to get too big. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. There's no such thing as arms that are too big. Like, if your body will allow yourself to go to that size naturally, then it's fine. Girls should see that, you know, yeah, I've got muscles, but I'm feminine. I'm attractive, I can wear nice things. And I said to Dina, can you teach me how to walk in your high heels? Because she wears a lot of high heels and I'm like, teach me how to walk in the high heels, please, Dina. Is that a part of your training? She said, yeah, it is. Strength for my calves, my Achilles. She's positive, she's strong, she's successful, and by the way, she's beautiful. It's a no-brainer, isn't it? <laughs> it's just a no-brainer. To be the best athlete you can be, you need to find your natural limits. You need to find what the edge of peak performance is for you. And for some people, that will be better than others because we're all born differently. And that's when you get the Olympic champion, the world champion, the world record holder, you know? It, it's all measured differently. But um, aesthetically, we're all going to achieve that by accomplishing that in different ways. But that's why your voice is so incredibly important because it's such a big thing for girls now and you're using your voice to convey that and you kind of need probably more i suppose sensible experienced people around these young athletes Definitely. but the voice that they all want to hear yeah. is from somebody who is a young athlete who's <laughs> achieved great things who's really cool and who you can provide that not just the education, but the inspiration that Thanks. goes Maybe with that. Thanks, blush if I could, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's thank you. It's incredibly important. Yeah. The young girl can see that someone like Dina, who's close in age, young, is able to reach those real highs in sport, do well and create a potential future for themselves. They can see that they can do it as well. So when you go out to run in a major event, what considerations are you giving to how you look? I look at that if I'm coaching someone. Yeah. I will get a better performance out of them if they feel good about themselves. A hundred percent. So where do you get your confidence from? I get my confidence from training, hands down. And I remember I do so many ad campaigns with various brands. It's like, do you get your confidence from your smile? Do you get your confidence from your eyeshadow? I'm like, no, I train six days a week. I get my confidence from my hard work. And I get the confidence from knowing that I've done everything within my power to be in the best shape on the line as possible. But how I like to look, I mean, like, then we're putting on a show. I think people always want to kind of put me or, or other athletes that like makeup in the box of, oh, do you need that to perform? Is it like your armor? Does it like give you confidence to go out with me? I'm like, no, my confidence comes from my hard work. But if I'm confident that I'm gonna go and perform well, then I'm gonna want, I personally wanna have some glittery eyes when I'm doing it. Like, that's to me, <laughs> I love makeup. That's what she brings, she brings the fun element because she is serious. She wants to look pretty on, on screen. She wants to have the right color hairband in her head. I said, Dina, really? Is that what you were thinking about the night before your race? She wants to look attractive. She wants to be coordinated. She wants to be, the nails have to be done. The hair has to be done. The makeup has to be done, the lipstick. I mean, she showed me some of her stuff and I was like, Dina, you're just ridiculous. She has got a palette of makeup. And I was like, this is so good because it should be fun. In the past few years, I've had to etch out kind of my own space in the female sports market because people are still understanding sportswomen. They're still very surprised that I like makeup. They're very surprised that 
um, eat sleep train isn't my whole life. Like I do see my friends, I do do other things. Like I am a rounded person, <laughs> I'm a normal person. And um, they're surprised that I like dresses, that I know a bit about fashion and that I've got other passions because I think there's this still this archaic view of sportswomen as very kind of, as sometimes little men. I think Dina represents two young girls, young black girls, that you can go out there and pretty much do what you want to do. And I think that's a message that they're not probably hearing enough. I don't think it's a message that I got as a kid growing up, but you could go out there and be anything. We're all diverse, we're all completely different people. We, we all had different ways into sports, we have different anxieties, different hang-ups, and we've all got different points of conversation. Like, we're all completely different. Diversity. <laughs> Makeup and fashion is part of self-expression for athletes and it's part of their identity and that's really important and I think that's particularly key for a black British athlete. Dina is more than just an athlete. She is a young black woman and as a black woman there are certain hurdles that are put in your way and so to be able to use that platform to say I've made it but these are the barriers that were put in my way that I had to break down, I had to get over in order to achieve what I'm achieving. She's come along at a very important moment, not just in British athletics, but, and, and certainly not just in British sport or, or global sport. She's come along at a very important moment socially uh, and politically for all of us. It's no accident that she was chosen to be in the rapper Dave's video, Black. Um, and he wrapped over her image, calling her a queen. Um, it's no accident that she was requested to be alongside Stormzy when he took over Elle. You know, she is seen as this really iconic black British female at a time where conversations about being a black woman in the UK are, are more audible than ever. I'm not surprised at Dave or Stormzy by using Dina uh, in their lyrics. Why would I be? We're proud of who we are. We see people like us every single day in our homes, in our families, in our friends. And so being proud of that is something that I'm extremely proud of. And I say, you know, more power to the elbow and let's keep going. How do you fund yourself as a full-time athlete? athlete? Because, you know, the <laughs> sport that I come from, obviously you get to the very top of it, as you have done in athletics, and they're, you know, the prize money, the endorsement opportunities yeah. are huge, but it's a very different world, isn't it, yeah. athletics? it's different. We do not have tennis prize money. <laughs> we are not in the same boat as that. But um, we have sponsors, which I'm very, very fortunate to have had many long-term sponsors. And even when I was younger, getting grants from people like Sports Aid or the GLL Sports Foundation. We have to invest. And that means investing in talent, not being blinded by any form of discrimination or bias. That we say, do you know what? This person is good. Let's invest in them. Let's take pride in them. Let's make sure that they can do sport, but also survive. I definitely fund myself through sponsors and race earnings because I have a team that I pay, like full-time salaries, and people forget that it's a business. So if you want the best coaches, if you want to train in the best facilities, if you want to have a nice flight so you get to the competition in the best possible condition, then you've got to have money behind you. Brands have a huge responsibility to give women um, a platform and a voice in sport. They're massively underrepresented in the press and that needs to change. We need more people to write about women's sport. We need more female journalists in sport. Um, and we really need to take it to the next level. But I think as brands, we've got the platform and the spending power to put women at the heart of our campaigns, which really gives them a share of voice. There is an inequality whereby for female athletes, you have to be Venus or Serena before brands will think about getting involved and supporting and sponsoring. 
And actually, there is this untapped opportunity to get in at the grassroots level to really be all the way through the journey of the next Vena, Venus and Serena, which gives you that journey all the way through of support right from the very beginning. If you look at the best in the world, somebody somewhere is putting a lot of money into it. It might not be the athlete directly, they might have benefactors or their, their national federation, say if you're from Qatar or something, they might fund the whole thing. And like, we're like Formula One cars, you know? Like that is literally how our bodies work. Everything works different for different people around the world. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you have to, you have to work hard to keep your income up so you can compete with the best, yeah. As you became more and more successful, did you have to bring in people, either your parents brought them in or John brought them in, to help you to manage, I don't know, the media demands or handling social media? Because you need to know how to get the best out of social media oh, yeah, and you definitely. need to know how to avoid the bad yeah. stuff. I pretty much do my own social media, but I'm very, I manage my own intakes and stuff with that as as well because I think I'm quite lucky that I'm not lucky but I understand myself quite well and so I understand how I am emotionally I understand what will upset me and stuff like that so I might be out there I might be tweeting and stuff but I might not take it in if that makes sense so I might put stuff out like I might post Do you a switch picture. off your notification oh yeah my notifications have been switched <laughs> off on my phone for years like <laughs> so many people will be so disappointed to hear that no no but I for years I don't even even think I've ever had my for social media I don't think I've ever had my notifications on in in a world right now of Instagram and you know, lots of people being famous for not very much. Dina is not interested in celebrity. What she's interested in is working hard and using her platform to do good. And I think that's why people love her. So how do you deal with any criticisms that come your way through social media? Most of the time, I just ignore it. Like, <laughs> I probably shouldn't say that. I'll make the trolls that are watching this very angry. But I honestly just ignore it. Like, all my socials are muted. Um, but even the notifications through the app, they can only come from, like, my friends. So I typically don't really see anything. And now and again, if I stumble on it, I never really take it personally because these people actually don't know me as a person. Like, most of them never met me. If they met you in real life, they wouldn't actually say that to your face. They're just kind of sitting there bored. They don't understand where I come from, understand my morals, my ethics. So it's rarely ever personal. And even though to some people it might feel personal, like they don't know you personally. Tell me a little bit about your career highlights. First one has to be Moscow 2013, when I was literally 17. I'd just come out of the juniors. I was just living my best life, became European junior champion. The next thing I got a GB senior call up for the relay. Never met any of the relay girls before. I went into anniversary games. It was straight after 2012, so everything was like huge. I've been literally running junior competitions in random bits of the world to running in a stadium in London the year after the Olympics in front of like 80,000 people. And then going to the World Championships, we went and finished fourth in the final, which was brilliant for us. I don't think people expect us to finish that highly. But then somebody got disqualified, so we ended up becoming bronze medalists. And I remember thinking, wow. For me, that was a moment of kind of self-belief. And then two years later, I was at the World Championships in Beijing. That was a big turning point for me because I'd gone sub-11 in the 100 a few weeks before in London, which was a marker because no women in the UK had done that before. Each of these are really big psychological steps, especially if you're developing, because you have to kind of take in the new environment, conquer your nerves, and then go and perform. And I was just kind of really happy with myself where I was racing people that suddenly I had spent loads of time kind of really admiring mm -hmm. and just looking up to and thinking that they were great. And suddenly I had to see them as rivals. I came fifth, but I knew I could have done better. I learned from that time that I needed to, I could do it and I wanted to do better, but also I needed to grow, I needed to focus, I needed to stay in the moment. Then the next highlight for me, I have to say, would be 2017 in London. And that was an interesting one for me because five months before I broke my foot. How do you handle that? Apart from the physical side of rehabbing, uh, there's the mental side of rehabbing. Uh, so you have to learn how to cope with injury. I've never broken a bone, thankfully. Um, but I think, uh, you know, in that situation, Dina really kind of shows the person she is because I think in situations like that, you can go one way or the other. 
when you rehab, your training volume goes up anyway because you have to be so more, so much more precise. So balancing that was was hard. I wouldn't want to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> I went from coming out of the crutches and the boot, learning how to walk, jog, sprint, and then sprint to a world championship standard in like four or five months, a very short period of time. So I was very happy with myself. I was very proud of myself, I have to say. That is definitely my proudest achievement. What was quite phenomenal about Dina was that even with something as um, destructive as a break, she was able to pull that, pull the kind of temperament she needs to get through and, and and uh, finish fourth. I went to the World Championships and I was really disappointed that I came fourth. <laughs> John was like, why on earth are you disappointed? Like, you literally couldn't walk, like, three months ago. But um, he turned around to me and said, the next one, you've got to win it, though. John has n had never said that to me before in the whole time that I'd known him. And I was just like, OK, let's go for it. The great thing about having a coach that's got that kind of foresight is that they will plan towards what they believe their athlete can, can get to and it's, it's fine for the athlete to feel bad. I mean, that's, that's kind of how we're wired, but then it's the coaches who are the, the, the master tacticians <laughs> that will get us to where we need to, to get to. And then obviously two years later in 2019, it happened. I was very annoyed that I did not win the 100 meters. <laughs> I can say that now. I was absolutely fuming, fuming. I did not run the race that I wanted to do. Um, not at all. But you know when you just, you know what you, you knew can it achieve. was possible. I knew it was possible, so I was very irked. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the World Championships. It's the, the best of the best. You can't afford to make those mistakes. You will lose if you don't execute, so. I did lose, <laughs> but, but, but I you the learn every, every time you have a setback or a disappointment or you lose you something, learn. you learn from it, yeah. don't you? I, it, that's coming through yeah. loud and clear from everything that you say and together with your coach and your parents. Uh, when she ran and won that, I was literally in tears um, because she did it the way that we had discussed it. She did everything right including the winning bit. What is actually next is hopefully a fantastic four years for track and field full stop, because with everything that's happened right now, we now have the Olympics in 2021. In 2022, we have the World Championships and Commonwealth Games and a European somewhere. 2023, we have World Championships. 2024, we've got Olympic Games. So in, I think, all of our history, we've never had four back-to-back -back global championships. It is a cycle full of opportunity, and we're all training to make sure that we are physically, mentally uh, the best, in the best possible shape that we can be for this wealth of opportunity in the next four years. I think that the sport is generally growing in public affection. I think our athletes are doing well and developing well, and we have loads of stories that are coming out of the sport that people can relate to, so. Um, yeah, I definitely think uh, athletics will be the sport to watch for the next four years. To, to be on that podium in the Olympics, that was her dream. That was her dream when she was younger, as she was going through the school, she always wanted to be an Olympian. Britain's going to be sick of track and field by 2025. It's going to be back to back to back every single summer, so we're going to be on your screens. It's that whole thing of if you can see it, you might just oh, one day 100%. be it. Oh, 100%. If you can see it, you can believe it and you can believe that that could be you. I'm a big fan of visibility. We, as humans, we're limitless. Anything is possible. Like, we can do anything. As long as it's within human nature, we can do anything. And, and we need to showcase that. And, yeah, when you see people performing to the best of their abilities and they've worked really hard for their whole lives at something, it, it does inspire other people to want to try and do that as well. If you want to do that and it's fun, then you can go and do that. And, and that's a viable career. It's a viable opportunity. And, and um, yeah, it's just amazing. Dina Asher Smith. Oh, <laughs> sorry, you I talk too are. much. <laughs> well, I do too, but I think you beat me. Um, you are a phenomenal athlete, and you are a remarkable young woman, and you are going to inspire a whole new generation of female athletes. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your story with me. Thank you very much for wanting to talk to me. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs>